So I'm going to do a short overview of the course I just taught called Six Half Truths, called Six Earth-Shaking, Mind-Bending, Life-Changing Half Truths, something like that, that everyone should know. Um, not everyone here has had that course, so it'll be a very brief overview. I do want people to know here that haven't had the course and on Facebook, you can still go get it. So it's it's now just all recordings, but um, I just sent out all six hour and a half courses plus the notes for the course to the people who took it. Um, and you can still uh, sign up for, and I'll just send you the recordings. When you go to the sign up, it'll it'll have dates in August. There will be no dates. It's not live anymore. But if you sign up, I will get an email and I will send you all the information if you're interested. So we're about to go just in an overview of that course. If it sounds exciting to you, you can um, you can go get all those recordings. Um, this is our Saturday community sit class. It happens every Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, it's a by do donation course. Uh, you donate whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, and I will put some uh, donation information in the chat window. Okay. So I'm just going to list the six truths in as simple a way as I can, and hopefully as compelling a way without having to go into all the talk that went around it in the club course. So the first truth we call the truth of life creation. This is a very simple truth. Many of you have heard me talk about this before, so it shouldn't be totally new. It's just the idea that our life is created by where we put our attention. That by controlling our attention, we get to control what kind of life we have. that there are an infinite number of places we could put our attention. So we have an infinite number of choices about what life we could have independently of what's happening to us in the external world. This is a fundamentally life altering understanding once you really grasp it. And one thing we practice in meditation is concentration, which is the control of our attention. And we can use that concentration to deepen our understanding of this truth. Oh yeah, right now I'm in the hospital, I'm in horrible pain, I'm scared about what's gonna happen, but my left big toe feels good. And I can go concentrate on that and feel that left big toe. And that changes the experience I'm having from a terrified, painful one to one that is more peaceful, more quiet. That's an extreme example. <laughs> we could also do ones where we're in, you know, a conversation with someone who's annoying us and so on and so on. Okay, so the truth of life creation. The second truth we said was the truth of empty aliveness. The phrase empty aliveness, the concept empty aliveness comes from, really comes from Mahamudra, Buddhism. Um, and the simplest explanation of that is just that when we start to attend to our life, when we use our attention to look very, very closely at what life is made of, we realize that life is impermanent. That is, everything is always flowing and changing from moment to moment, micro moment to micro moment. And that what the universe is made of is our processes and not things as much. And that what we are is a process and not a thing. That the world is more a verb than a noun, and that it's alive, fresh, and constantly being recreated. This is the truth of empty aliveness. That our life is empty of things and constantly growing like a living thing, constantly re-emerging, rebirthing. The mind likes to work with things for a very good reason, and it can be useful, of course. But what it does is it deadens our life so that we're constantly living with a mind-created set of objects 
to make us blind to the alive reality behind those objects. And so meditation allows us to look closely at our life. And when we do, we discover this process that's unfolding. Much like when a physicist looks at a hard rock or a table and looks very, very closely, we realize, oh my gosh, this thing is a miracle. It's mostly emptiness, but it's probabilities and waves and it's, it's this activity. A rock is an activity and you are an activity. The third truth was the truth of absolute freedom from self. And by self, we mean, I can just jump to the end. We mean your conventional idea of yourself. And I've already given you a sense of that with this notion of empty aliveness. You're not a thing the way you might think you are. What keeps coming to my head, have you all seen uh, Mad Max Fury Road? A movie that must be brought up in most meditation classes because it's so meditative. Uh, it's a very, but there is a, the women who are being kidnapped and pain on the walls. We are not things. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. We're not things. That's good. <laughs> um, we treat ourselves as things most of the time. So we're not things, we're processes. But it's more than that. We realize that the things we think we are are our memories, our thoughts, our feelings our plans, our hopes, our dreams, all of these things. And these are things we can observe in our experience. Oh yeah, there is my, there, there I am hoping, there I am dreaming, there I am thinking, there I am imagining, there I am feeling, right here, right here. But we are the observer of those things. We are not the things we are observing. When I sit here and look at the computer, I can see that I am not identical to the computer because I'm the observer of the computer. This is a remarkably important insight because it allows us to see that we are not our thoughts. We are not our feelings. We are the observer. We're the space within which those things happen. And so just as we did in the meditation today, we let the breath arise and fall within our experience without controlling it. We can do the same thing with our mind, with our emotions, with our thoughts, with our memories, with our plans, with the entire external world. And we realize, oh, I'm sitting here spaciously as everything else that I might think is me continues changing. This gives us an absolute freedom from the conventional sense of self. Not only are we not a thing, but we are not anything we can observe directly. And there's a deep mystery in this, that the one thing we are most certain of, that I am here, is also the one thing I can't observe, I can't find in my experience. This is the truth of absolute freedom from self. You are bigger than, more spacious than, undetermined by the contents of your awareness. So the fourth truth was the truth of pure awareness. And we start to ask the question, well, what are we then if we are not what we think we are? What are we then if we are not our memories, our dreams, our hopes, our feelings, our relationships, our bodies? Well, we're something that can't be observed. So any word we use is going to miss it to some some degree. But a good first approximation is to say we're awareness. We're the thing that's aware of everything. And although it can't really be observed, this this awareness has certain 
properties we can sort of talk about, right? It's, it's, it's formless, that is, it doesn't have a shape. It doesn't have a location. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. It's, it's formless. There's a lot to say about that, but essentially when we start to let go of form and allow the idea that we may not, we need not be identified with form, we start to identify with an eternal aspect of ourselves. And eternal just means it doesn't seem to change in time. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. It doesn't seem to be un unwinding. It doesn't um, have boundaries in space. And the most important, to my mind, for why I teach, the most important part of, of pure awareness, of, of, the, of this way of thinking about ourselves, is that pure awareness is perfectly accepting without effort, effortlessly accepting. Pure awareness just allows whatever is going to arise to arise. It allows whatever is going to go away to go away. Some, one of the truths we learned in the class is about suffering. And we realized that if we are in a state of an acceptance, we can reduce our state of suffering. So by tuning into awareness, we get free access to reduction in suffering because awareness is already non-suffering. When we identify with something we are not, we start to suffer. When we identify with what we are, we end suffering. The fifth truth was the truth of transcendent wholeness. And this is maybe where it becomes obvious that why I said half truths at the beginning of the title of the class, six half truths, because this will seem to contradict something we said earlier, but it's just as true as the thing we said earlier. There is a intrinsic, the unified Experience we have is intrinsically unified. Let's put it that way. I'm trying to simplify this as much as possible. That our sense of separation comes from our mind separating us into things. When the mind no longer does that, when we sit underneath that mind, we start to see that everything arises in awareness equally. Then, in fact, it's almost as if everything is awareness. Everything is made of the same experiential stuff. So there's this diversity of, of our, in the world. The, the, the transcendent wholeness does not mean there isn't diversity. There is a vast diversity of things going on in experience. But it's all unified by the same substance what we can call the, we can give that words like awareness or being or all sorts of things. People have named it Atman. And this is a truth that, you know, they're talking about something different. So it's not the same thing, but it, it it's in tune with what, where we want to go as scientists as well, right? Physicists tell us that our world is unified. They haven't totally proven that yet, but that's the assumption that everything is working in harmony. Everything, everything you see in the physical world is harmoniously unified by one law. And that law operates everywhere at every point in time and space 
equally. There's no sense that that law makes any distinction between this arm and the air around it, or this arm and the computer, or this arm and that tree. They're all the same ocean. And so in this view, we are a patch of water in an ocean, constantly being ex molecules being exchanged through us. And we're not really separate from anything. And there's, again, something maybe a little scary about this, but it is incredibly peaceful when you directly experience it because you lose the sense of separation and you have a sense of being at home at all places. Because in a sense, it's all equally you. Not the conventional you, not your simple small you, but the you that we found, this bigger you. It's all you. No little part of it is wholly you. but it's all equally you. And this leads us into the truth of universal love. This one's hard to simplify without it sounding ridiculous. Um, it, so it's all love, dude. That's not how that one goes. <laughs> um, once we've sort of realized that the structure of our experience is made up of this thing that's, that's like pure awareness and that it's unified with the object and subject of experience are unified. We see that one of the best words to describe what's going on here is love. It's not identical to normal human love, but it has a lot of the same qualities. Love brings us together. When we tune into the truth of ourself, we realize, oh, we are unified with all things. Love gives us pleasure in the object. When we tune into the truth of ourselves, that is when we let go of judgment, that is when we accept all pieces of the world and our interior, we transcend good and bad and end up in a state of bliss, which is not the exact same as your normal sense of pleasure, but it is, has some similarities. Love sees the good in the object that love is interacting with. Awareness accepts everything as it is. And again, in a kind of sense, transcends normal good and bad to a broader sense of goodness, a kind of okayness of all things. This one's hard to walk the line of keeping it simple. What we tune into is a sense that our basic nature is creative and loving, it's creative and, and, and accepting, it's seeing the good that is available in every moment of our life. Before the mind divides the universe into bad and good and beds and cars, before the mind does that, there is a presence that is purely accepting. And it's totally natural that people use words like God and all, you go into really religious and spiritual language because it is, we are describing something that isn't exactly like normal life and it is 
transformative, but you can also keep it very, very simple and just say, hey, we're just describing what, our, what it is to, what our fundamental being is like. And it's this open, accepting, blissful, timeless, boundless, unified nature. And then to play the game of life, the mind comes in and starts carving that up, putting boundaries on it, shaping it. And that's okay. That's a beautiful part of everything too. It's actually not separate. It's just when we believe the mind that suffering arises. We can play the game of mind very, very well without having to believe it including anything I just said. Okay, so that is a quick overview. Um, Facebook, I'm going to check off now. Uh, love you all. Have a great week. Um, if you want to join, you can jump on to this class and we'll be doing some question and answers. Um, I am going to turn off the Facebook now. Um, today, just because it's a little bit of a unique class, uh, because I am not, not, not everyone here was in the course, so it doesn't really matter. But I, I often I just want you to know, often on our med, this course, you know, we'll, we'll have more personal questions. And that's still welcome today. Um, we'll work with what whatever's coming up with people. But today, because it's sort of a review for the course we just finished. I'm going to keep recording just so you know that if you're uncomfortable being on this recording that I, that, uh, you know, I might share with other people, you can take yourself off camera or you can decide however you want to use that. <laughs> but this is just sort of an open question period for what, again, whatever's going on in life, whatever you want to, I just want you to know, I'm going to keep recording this because I'll probably send it to the class. Um, great. So any questions about the course as a whole, what I just said, if you were not on the course as a whole, meditation reports of what's going on in your meditation today or at large. A couple of people I haven't seen for a while. Good to see you. Beautiful faces. Is anyone not speaking because I'm recording? Because if that's the reason, I will can stop the recording. <laughs> no one has to speak. I just realized that's the only thing I've changed from normal. I have something to, to throw in our conversation soup. Great. Um, um, I just had a birthday, and I think that a lot of... Um, a lot of like questions about meaning have been like coming up in my mind. And I mean, one thing that I think my mind settled on is that 
I want to like in a in a small way contribute to a more loving and peaceful world and what I can do is perhaps be a more loving and peaceful awareness of the existence of Betsy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I just, I think I'm working on, but also this is all like, maybe this is all just, just mind story. And I think I just, I don't know, something about that answer feels good, but also something I'm one, I'm just, I just am wondering about if there's something deeper or I think now I'm like, well, I don't want to get too caught up in that story or I don't know. I feel just a little bit like I almost touched on something, but then also the more I try to hold the something, the more I feel unsure. Yeah, well, that's great, actually. But so did that unsureness come because of the class today or you were already feeling that unsureness about it? Well, I think I came. I think my unsureness led me here today. Okay, yeah. (laughs) Just because some of these truths, you know, it's the way I was going through can make it sound like I'm saying the mind is bad. And I want to make clear that I'm not saying that, right? Um, The freedom to see beyond the mind is really important. And that's where the mind gets prob- problematic is that it, it hides us from everything else. But once we can see beyond that, then the mind, it's just a beautiful tool and it can be very fun. Um, but this idea of there's something good and I could sense that there's something more is a beautiful place to be. And I would just, I would, before I want to go into this topic, because this is a really interesting topic to add into what we just discussed, but uh, as a practical, as a piece of practice in life, uh, many of you have heard me say, um, we do the next most obvious thing. That's what, that's how we proceed through our life. We do the next most obvious thing. And that and this is kind of an example of that. I, I took it that you goes, okay, well, how could I, 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 I want meaning one. And then you go, okay, what would be meaningful? Well, if I could make, bring more love into the world. Okay. How would I do that? If I could love myself better, right? And maybe be a more loving presence, but also care for my this this being as possible. Great, beautiful, and that's that's beautiful. That's sort of the next most obvious thing. Like the mind goes, oh, I want to make the world a better, loving. I want to create, boom, boom. and then you're like, well, how do I do that, right? Well, what do I do in this? So now you still at a, you're right. You're still at a mind level there. Like well, I'm going to be more loving towards myself. But then the question is, well, how in this moment? does that manifest? How in this present moment, and the mind will try to figure it out, but you can usually flip it on his head and be like, well, no, I'm just trying to ride a bike. What feels like I'm being more loving in this moment? So I just want to put that as a practical thing. We we can use the mind to sort of focus ourselves, but then the only way to bring anything we come up with into practice is to come back to the present moment and find the concrete, almost microscopic thing we can do right now. Mind is not comfortable with that. It wants to run past. Yeah. So we have to go, thank you, mind. Now, how can I do that right now? Does that make sense? Well, because the whatever you can do right now is going to be different in every present moment. Right. That's where the mind fails because it wants to generalize and categorize. But, and that's useful. But actual life is lived in concretized specifics that are utterly unique. Mm hmm. So I do want to throw something out about meaning. See, I, I, I'll, going off of what you said, so meaning is usually, a, like we want meaning in our life. We Usually what we mean by that is we want to connect with something bigger or more valuable or something. We want to say this thing that I am or this thing that I'm doing is connected, like has some like connection to something 
really important or bigger or better. So I want the whole world to be loving. Yeah, that fits the category, right? If I could connect my life to a more loving world, then that feel meaningful. Did you want to say something? No, that just, that totally, that tracks. Right. So first of all, I just want you to think about, I, I know that you, you weren't in the course, so we went through that stuff very quickly, but one thing we're realizing is that we are always connected to the biggest thing possible. And when we can live our life like that, we sense the meaning of every moment there as a human experience. Again, there's a sense of meaningfulness in every moment because we were at, at, at once at home and connected. We just can't help but be connected to the bigger thing. So that's, the, that's sort of the, the meditative enlightenment transcendent connection with toward move towards meaning. You can't do that with the mind. You have to suddenly just start to, in the moment, feel that connection. And that satisfies that, that drive for meaning. But again, we start where we are and like we may not like feel most of us don't feel connected like that all the time right we, that's where suffering comes from so what, what do we do well we stay in this moment how do i this is the same thing we just said i'm just using slightly different words how do i connect in this moment and it can be as simple as i'm going to see the green bedspread that is here right now I'm actually seeing green that is actually here right now. I'm actually connecting to my experience rather than worrying about something that happened 20 years ago, right? I'm actually connecting. They can be just, just that simple or it can be more richer and it can be you and I hearing each other, right? And there's connection. You can feel it. You can feel the connection. You can be in a group and you can feel the connection. And again, that starts to move us towards, that's meaning right there. That's meaning. One thing I do like to say was, what if the meaning of your life, for some people, this will work. Some people, it means nothing. What if the meaning of your life was this? This was the meaning of your life. This moment was, everything was leading to this. How would that change your experience of this present moment? That's more transcendent. But the simple thing is, how do I connect with this present moment? That will move me to a greater sense of connection with the greater, the bigger, the more valuable. You feel that? Love you. So good to see you. Will you have anything you want to add to that? Oh, I just, I think that there, it, it feels very freeing and, and powerful. Um, and yeah, if it just, yeah, that feels extremely liberating. I think that um, I'm just thinking a lot about, um, letting go of, of urgency, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and Yeah, and and I think also um, just the way that you 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 talked about like just seeing this bedspread, the the green of this bedspread right now. Um, that that's so that's so concrete. That feels like because um, I think I've also been thinking a lot about um, okay, how how do I at times. Um, when I feel very much on the roller coaster of my emotions. Um, and I, I, I mean, I feel a lot of attachment to my emotional life. Okay. Um, and uh, how, I want to step into that, that loving awareness. 
of it. And I think sometimes I feel very unsure. I meditate in the morning, but it's afternoon. And I feel right. like I can't, that, that well is just feels too far away. Um, but the idea of being in the morning, when I start to feel carried to maybe just see the blue wall um, or see like one of my, my fingernails covered with paint at the moment um, as a as just a, a little tiny door into that is really uh, really actionable. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Yep. I, I use that phraseology it's, and it's a tiny door, but it's a doorway to a big world. So if you actually really keep squeezing yourself down into that door, you will, you will go through. So that's what we call resource. I think you've heard us talk about that, I'm sure, right? So that's the, take this moment, you're, you're being overwhelmed, find, and resource is just a simple anything, a simple thing that's not a problem, like the spread, bed spread, right? So mm -hmm. that's half of it. And the other half is, well, how do I be connected in this moment? All I fear is, all I feel is anger. Well, then you connect to your anger. But that's different, right? That you feel the anger as an ex sensory experience. What is this actually like right now? As opposed to getting lost in the story, because the story of anger is about someone over there at another time, right? Yeah. The anger of the moment or the fear of the moment or the sadness of the moment or whatever is also something we can connect to in a, in a very healthy way. So, and that's more challenging because we're, we're, it's very easy for us to get caught in the story. So that's why we practice resource first, the things that are easier, the green bread spread, my breath, whatever it is. But then we, as we get better at coming into the present moment, we want to start to connect with the whole of the present moment. And that will include the challenging parts. It makes sense that, um, that thinking about where, where I might be feeling anger in my body is a way of like, getting into the present and and trying to stay out of the story i mean because anger is going to to come up so then but if i can oh my chest feels tight oh i feel i don't know that that feels yeah. your chest being tight and that person should never have gotten uh, run into the, my bumper they they don't if you really look at them there's no relation there's no actual reason right so when you go into the chest tightness that story isn't there we add the story on top of the chest tightness right so when we go into our anger and just feel the feeling in the body we're, we're going underneath the story well then what do you think happens so then when we go into how, the actual feeling in our body then if we allow ourselves to feel that and then breathe into that space it is it will eventually pass or there just feels like there's more space around it, even if it doesn't pass. Yeah. Those are both, both, both things. Yeah. I mean, this is, that's a longer conversation that, that, but no, no, but if, yeah. So we, you know, the first thing is just to connect with it as it is. And it's good for the mind to have a story about how it'll go. So it feels a little safer doing that, but to, but the first thing was just, well, how is it? We'll find out. The truth is, of course, it will pass. Everything passes. So, of course, it's going to pass. And yes, the truth is also that if we can look at it without being caught in the story, we'll have space around it. And we can practice that by like feeling some resource while we're feeling it. Like, oh, I see the green bread spread. I feel my anger. I see the green bread spread. I can't say that. See the green bed spread. See the green bed spread. See the green bed spread. <laughs> You see the green bed spread, and then you feel your anger, right? You go back and forth. So, you're getting more space around it. Ultimately, these emotions are movements of motivation. They want us to do, so they, they want to move. They can feel stuck, but they want to move. So we allow them to have space to start moving, just like our breath. I think that's going to be good for you for a little while. Yeah, but come back and we can work on it more. Or just give me a call or whatever you want. Love you. Love you so much. I'm so glad to be here. So good to see your face.
What else? I have something else to to mention if if other other folks are um if it's brief yeah go ahead i was just going to ask about um uh the the balance you're talking about attention mm. and that we can choose where we're going to put our attention mm. okay and i i want i just i want to ask just about the balance between uh accepting the things that maybe we our mind wishes weren't true, but then also not like the acceptance of those things, but not giving them attention and then turning attention to something else. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a good question. I think everybody has it um, in general. The first thing with that truth of, of life creation and the truth of how we can move our attention is the first important thing to learn with that is to learn is the, res the truth of resource, which is that if we actually scan around all the places we could put our attention, most of it's okay. So that's the first important thing to lose. So when we're talking about balance, we're so out of balance towards our problems. We're just so out of balance and leaning towards attending to our problems that the first thing is to not worry too much about, am I looking at my problems enough? Because <laughs> you're, trust me, you're looking at them enough and to start, you know, seeing that there's safety all around. So that's the first part of balancing those two things. Ultimately, then we, you know, it's really just what you were just talking about. We want to look at the green bread spread, but we also want to feel the anger, right? And what, what ultimately we will actually stop controlling our attention and allow whatever to arise and then accept that as it is. So that's, that's the funny thing about that first truth is that it's a way of allowing us to get enough safety to stop controlling our attention is really what it's all about. So at first, what I would say, those, the rule I use is try not to get overwhelmed. It's okay, you'll get overwhelmed, but we want to use our attention in a way that we spend as little time in being overwhelmed as possible. Because when we're not overwhelmed, then we can feel our anger, we can feel our sadness, we can look at our problems, we can do that in a mm, spacious way. When we're overwhelmed, we're stuck inside. So we use our attention to get enough safety so that we can experience our life in a state of non-overwhelm. That's the wisdom that one has to learn about how to balance those two things. That's a, but that's a very, that makes sense though. And overwhelm is a thing, you know it when you have it, but overwhelm is just, it's generally a state of, I can't control my attention. <laughs> that's what it is. It's like, oh, I can't control my attention anymore. Like I literally can't get out of this thought, feeling, whatever. And so we want to get, keep ourselves in the space where we can keep moving our attention. Okay, what else? Yeah, Kathy. Um, I would just in some of those things that you were were saying so far, um, like the current, you know, this this exact moment, I um, tend to have a thing where us, you know, I meet somebody, even just right here. Everything in my life and that person's life life has led to this moment. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of that that. Uh, even you know the tree that tree has you know all the evolutions and everything da, 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 right here right. and to me somehow that kind of sometimes it can be too hard like at the grocery store I mean and really um you, you know every person I see and sometimes it happens like oh my god look this all of us look we all just are doing this and then I just you know um and get two yeah. to what, whatever that word is, but it's, it is a thing, um, you know, when I'm cooking, like, oh my God, just think, all the people who bought these seeds and made this and harvested and, uh, you know, try and, and their kids had to go to school, try and that somehow um, 
I don't know. I hope that's not going too much into story, but it somehow brings me it, it those concrete things which help me get right here. Yeah. Um, I mean, everything I uh, everything I'm telling you today is a story. So stories are are useful, and right, you know, we, we want to get under them. But the only way to communicate is via stories. So very useful to have stories that help that are useful to practically bringing your attention into the present moment or into more acceptance or into less suffering. So that's yeah. Don't go, don't get too worried about it. again. Story is not bad. It's hard to talk about this without making bad things and good things. The story is not bad. It's just when we are fully believe it. But yeah, every moment, there's like 13.8 billion years of a whole universe <laughs> to bring us all together right in this moment. If that's not magical and, you know, spectacular and miraculous, then nothing is, right? And that's true of every moment of our life. And that, that's sort of part of the truth of transcendent wholeness is that we're just connected to this much, 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 much bigger, unimaginably bigger thing that is literally connected to us in every moment and everyone else we're seeing. And the things that our mind is all worried about is just, just they're, they're not even, it's not even fair to call them minuscule in the size of things. And then, yes, that's a story that can be useful. But then, like you said, that story can also make you go, whoa, get a little vertigo. And so you stop that story and you just come back to the present moment and you just feel the floor on your, under your feet. And then you're connected to that big thing, but you don't need to have an idea of the big thing. You can just be directly connected to it through another person too, the stranger in the, in the grocery store. You don't need to tell a big story to just go, if I'm connected to that person, I'm connected to everything. And as Betsy said that, you know, you open a little doorway. Well, anywhere you look are doorways. That's all there are, are doorways into connection. If you actually decide to go through them. including your sadness, your anger, including your suffering. That's also a doorway. In some ways, it's the most powerful doorway, but, you know. Yeah, I see that, Nadine. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's how I define it. Overwhelm is, is when you can't control your attention. This reminds me, let me put this... Uh, donation information it's in the chat window for anyone who wants to make a donation um what else Cassiel, so good to see your face i somewhere in social media <clears throat> you just do a big performance or you're about to do a big performance or i just did a crazy big thing in berlin fantastic congratulations okay bye thank you it's um it's so good to be back so good to see you <laughs> um yeah i was very very happy um to meditate with you um and i i i just wanted to describe kind of um a wave of three moments in which somehow in the first half an hour i like totally like like relaxed and kind of let go of the grip and yeah like this is obviously in the realm of interpreting my experience but it's crazy because i haven't been meditating so much and so it was like re-entering in in a hot bath or in another way of functioning it was like my mind was like whoa this is so weird or like <laughs> like just i mean really enjoying letting go but it was like really um um i could feel my system not being accustomed to it anymore and it felt quite good to be honest it was just a... um 
And as I was starting, then the second moment kind of the session was when I was listening to Betsy speaking. Um, I guess I had time to go back into self reflectively look at my story or uh, review myself, um, review my story. Um, and I mean, what was coming up was a lot of sadness or um, slash anger slash also being worried about it. Um, and sadness and anger related to what? Related to somehow when I look at the last year and the last six months, um, it could be said that I went through very hard things and like things that were really, really painful and stuff that, uh, yeah, like really, I mean, somehow pain that I had not experienced so much in my life so far, and mainly in the professional realm actually, but like, just like really, really tough. And in a way I feel I really had to like harden, um, like to manage through it. And um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, I'm not giving a lot of like things that are maybe a bit stiffer or I'm just feeling less or I'm just like going through things and like a bit more like this. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I had all this sadness and pain coming up. But it feels good, right? Mm. It feels good. Mm. Gladness and pain coming up, it feels good in a way. In a way, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, in a way it does. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so I was balanced, I was balancing. I was swinging between feeling distressed about it or, you know, like also looking at being like, oh, fuck. It's like, maybe I should deal with this. Um, and also towards the end, kind of simply relaxing. Uh, when you were speaking about the rule that you have that what matters like like this rule of thumb not to go into overwhelm or not to spend too much time into overwhelm and when you were mentioning that most of what we perceive is good I was like oh yeah I can also just just enjoy now whatever can be enjoyed yeah, I have no uh, big conclusions or solid views on all of that, but uh, yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing, Cassiel. Yeah. Um, yeah, you just enjoy the moment. And, and yeah, the other stuff's going to come up too, if it needs to, if it needs to. So the... Um, I get the strongest experience from this from playing basketball, which is, uh, you know, if I pick up a basketball now and I don't play basketball very much at all, but I immediately, my whole body sort of relaxes and I, you know, there's like parts of my nervous system that just turn on and, and um, I'm sure that's true with you with dancing, but it's also true with meditation. So you've spent intensive periods of meditation. You have access to ways of turning the nervous system down 
that, yeah, you might not access them for a while, but the second you start to tune into them, your whole body is like, oh yeah, I remember this whole pathway that's still there. Right. And part of what we do in meditation over the, part of what people would say is describe as um, stabilizing awakening is just getting a bit broader and broader neuronal pathway. So wherever you are, you keep finding yourself back in that, that letting go state. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, that, that, that description just, what that really shows is, I mean, this can happen to anyone, but it's more likely to happen to someone like you who's practiced intensively that, oh yeah, I've done a lot of work on the system. I've, I've opened a big doorway for myself mm -hmm. if I want to go back through it to relax and release. And that allows me to then immediately start feeling feelings from the last six months that I, I, I didn't feel. And to feel them in a way where it does feel good in a little bit, like you realize they have the minds like, do I need to deal with this? But there's another part of you. It's like, no, I just need to feel this. And that's going to be okay because I've done this before. I can feel hard things. Okay. So that I want that I want to give a little bit of a sense of safety in your nervous system that you've done some work that's there for you that will never go away. And yes, you can add to it in a way, but it's, it's already there and it's already there to support whatever is next for you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So good to see you. Thanks for sharing. Mm. Okay, so it's eleven thirty. Um, it was so good to see everybody. We're here every every week at ten a.m. I'm sure we'll start a new course at some point. Um, for anyone who didn't sign up, you can still get that whole course. It's seven and a half hours of. of me talking <laughs> mostly which uh, that sounds awful but if you're if you're into that kind of thing uh you can uh, send me an email or you can go sign up on uh on luma where you sign up for this course um much love everyone send me messages emails if you have any questions or reports you want to share with me talk to you soon connect connect <laughs>